Hi, I'm Bob Roswell, founder and a curator at the System Source Computer Museum. Today's gallery talk is about our slow, giant computer from 1963, the only remaining UNIVAC 490. I'm producing this video from home because we're under quarantine uh, due to COVID-19. The UNIVAC 490 is the largest CPU we have at System Source Computer Museum. It is 12 feet long, six foot six inches high by three feet deep, and that's just the CPU. An entire installation took up full rooms. We are fortunate to have a number of period photographs of UNIVAC 490 setups that were um, at the UNIVAC archives at the Hagley Library in Delaware. When the UNIVAC 490 was first created, there were no such things as hard drives. We did have tapes and memory drums. When hard drives were invented, they were enormous. Love this picture that could be added to an existing UNIVAC 490. Besides being the largest, it's also the slowest CPU that we have. It's very difficult to compare speeds of CPUs. Benchmarking is a real art, particularly when we do it over a, nearly a 60-year period. But to a very rough order of magnitude, the iPhone 4, it happened to be new when we got the UNIVAC, is about 1 110,000 times faster than a UNIVAC 490. Amazing. Uh, it also happens to be true that if you started to stack standard size phones, you can fit 110,000 phones inside the iPhone. It's also the most expensive CPU that we have. Uh, $2 million when it was new, 1963, so figure that's about $16 million today. Um, you may have noticed many of the signs say real-time system under the UNIVAC 490. That's important. In 1963, and in fact, really up until the late 1970s, almost all computers were batch oriented. We went to a key punch machine, we typed our programs, we typed our data, we brought the deck of cards over to an operator. That operator submitted the cards. We waited for the machine to get to our job. And then typically about a half an hour later, we picked up some green bar paper in my case, it often showed errors, so I went back to the key punch machine and repeated. A real-time system was different. One could sit at a terminal and get instant feedback, much like we do at a PC or laptop today. You could also take data from various instrumentation systems. That made the 490 an excellent choice for NASA to track telemetry data from the Gemini and Apollo missions. In this image, we see our UNIVAC 490 set up at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. The computers at the back, tape drives to the left, operators, consoles, and terminals in the foreground. And please notice on the right, you'll see a map of the world. Um, over that map are some strings, and each of those strings represents a data link sending data from all the way around the world back to Goddard Space Flight Center. Let's take a minute and look at how this worked in more detail. The Gemini and Apollo spacecraft had radios in them. They broadcast in a very narrow beam, so we needed to have an antenna that could focus on the spacecraft to get telemetry data back and forth. Here's the one that was at the Goddard Space Flight Center. But of course, it had to point more or less up. As the spacecraft circled the Earth, we needed to go to different tracking stations. So there was a series of 12 tracking stations at various locations on the Earth. And in some cases, there was no Earth where you needed a tracking station. So the tracking stations were on Navy ships. Each tracking station had a UNIVAC 1218 also known as the UNIVAC CP855 on board, and that did uh, intermediate data processing. The data were then sent 
over radio links back to Greenbelt, Maryland. If you look at the top of our Univac, you'll see in the mirror a series of connectors. That's where the radio modem is plugged into the Univac. Here's the 28 connectors along the top. And look at that, I'm embarrassed to find a stink bug. Reminds me of Grace Hopper's famous bug. This article um, from the Univac newspaper um, brags about how the 12 Univac 1218s operated for 910 hours without a single failure during the historic Gem Depot space mission. It goes on to explain how the data was summarized and then beamed um, to the space capsule and then transmitted to the two Univac 490s at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, the data that was um, processed included in-flight information such as the astronauts' pulse beat, blood pressure, temperature, and other real-time data. Again, because the UNIVAC was a real-time system, it was selected by Northwest Airlines, Eastern Airlines, and British Airways to make the first passenger name record system. Think of a reservation system. This is what the uh, travel agents had as terminals. They went via modem, connected into the UNIVAC. This allowed a thousand terminals uh, across the world to access a single database. That was brand new. Again, 1963, before the PNR system, passenger name record system. If you reserved a flight, you called the airline, somebody found the notebook with that flight in it, they wrote your name down. If you had to make a change, they got out the white out and away it went. I'm also excited about the Univac 490. It was my very first computer that I saw with my own two eyes. The American Library Association set up a Univac 490 at a pavilion at the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair. You could walk into the pavilion, look in the window, and see a computer with your own two eyes, not just on television. Um, we were allowed to walk up to terminals, and in a 50-year predecessor of the internet, we could type in a topic. In this case, someone um, on October 17, 1965, typed in hobbies and then we printed out a 700 word essay from the Encyclopedia Britannica talking about hobbies. You could type in any subject that was covered in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now let's take a minute or two and talk about the construction of the UNIVAC. It's a very simple machine, 16 and a half thousand transistors, about 18,000 diodes, many resistors. Um, each of these little circuit boards has a handful of transistors on it, you may notice some very colorful test points. Um, the computer was not terribly reliable. A thousand hours mean time between failure was quoted. So those test points were used to troubleshoot each and every board. We're very lucky to have all the original documentation for the Unifact 490. So we have a very large book. Each page of the book diagrams what's going on on one of those circuits. I'm very much a beginning electrical engineer, but these circuits are simple enough that even I can trace them and troubleshoot them, giving me hope that one day we'll get this UNIVAC back in operation. Um, if you look closely here, you'll see that each board has a number on it. That number corresponds to a page in the book. Of course, it takes about 1,500 of those little circuit boards to make up the CPU. They look very neat from the front, but then they all have to be wired together in the back. What a rat's nest. I have no idea why they use so many white wires. We do on the display have an article from Forbes magazine documenting how the technician did the initial wiring of the Univac 490. The Univac 490 has um, 30K words, 96 kilobytes of core memory. Each byte is made up of 10 eight bits for a byte and two bits for parity and checksums. Each bit is one of these little magnetic donuts that has three wires sewn between it. Those boards are put together. There's four sections of memory 
on the left, and then a driver circuit, and they're sandwiched together about 10 deep. And then 10 of them are on the top of the door, 10 of them on the middle of the door, 10 on the bottom. And then there's another set on the back of the door. That memory subsystem with 96 kilobytes of memory weighs 280 pounds. And here we see some executives from the mid 1960s at what the Bowery Savings Bank looking at the memory. That's all for today. When the COVID virus is over, please come visit us at the Computer Museum. You can see the Univax up close. You can see an Apple One, hundreds and thousands of other artifacts, and we're looking forward to meeting.